I'll, I'll be talking to you about uh, stem cell biology and the idea of regeneration in a particular system, which is the nervous system. And I'll um, particularly concentrate on this part of the brain, but not only, that is the cerebral cortex, which is the top part of the brain, and it's really the part of the brain that evolved uh, later in evolution and makes us uh, humans. So, so it's the part of the brain that makes us think and be, in a way, intelligent. So uh, as you have heard from probably from other talks and from what Alex just said, uh, during early stages of development, uh, you um does this work? Okay. During early stages of development, you can isolate from the very early stage embryo a population of stem cells called embryonic stem cells, which have the potential under the appropriate signals to differentiate and form virtually cells of every type of organ within the body. So you can form the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the, the blood, the river, the skin, and so on, all from one original type of cell that has all this potential. And so immediately from this slide, you get the sense that it's very, very important to understand how this cell does this. What are the signals that take this type of cell or a pluripotent stem cell and make it become nervous system instead of blood? And most importantly, within the nervous system, what controls the ability of that cell to give rise to the different cell types that constitute the nervous system? So this is the outline of the class today. What I'd like to do is to first tell you a little bit about the nervous system, and not just like an, an exercise to learn about it, but because uh, I think it's extremely important to understand how complex this tissue is and how many different types of cells there are here, because this has to do with the idea that if we want to regenerate any part of the brain or any cell type of the brain that dies in a specific neurodegenerative disease, we need to be able to understand how to make one neuron type versus a different type of neuron. And so first of all, we need to understand how many different types there really are uh, here. Um, and then I'll try to illustrate this concept of uh, heterogeneity of neuron types that you find in the nervous system by telling you about uh, a couple of neurodegenerative diseases which are characterized by the death of specific types of neurons within the brain and how different they are from each other in the symptoms because different types of cells die in these different diseases. And then I'll move on and tell you more about neural stem cells and development of the brain. So why development of the brain? It's sort of what Alex already said. We can learn a lot if, we, if our goal is to understand how a specific type of cell in the brain is made. The best place to look and learn that is to look at the embryo and see how Mother Nature has done it actually through gestation because that's really the time when all of these signals that control the formation of this complex tissue come about. So the hypothesis that many of us have in in our research is that if we could understand how the embryo has done it, maybe we can redo it in a tissue culture dish and recreate at least some of these uh, neuron types. And then I'll tell you about uh, those studies that Alex just mentioned at the end of his class, where uh, uh, the couple of studies really, where some of these signals that were understood during development could be applied to differentiate embryonic stem cell to form specific type of neurons, in particularly motor neurons of the spinal cord and dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra, which are the ones that die in uh, Parkinson's disease. And then I'll end by telling you that aside from uh, embryonic stem cell, which could be an interesting sort of source of stem cells to produce new neurons, there is also the fact that within the adult nervous system, also the human brain, there are some some, not that many, but some neural stem cells. So there is a depository of stem cells that just stays there, uh, even as we age, that could be exploited to uh, differentiate and produce new neuron without transplanting uh, new material inside the brain. All right, so the first thing that we need to know is that the brain is actually a very complex tissue, and it's like you can envision it as several organs within the same organ. So if you take, if you look at this cross-section of the brain, by that I mean that has been cut right in the middle and sort of opened up, you'll see that the cortex, which is this top part here, is very different from the corpus callosum here, from the cerebellum and, and, and the spinal cord down here. And then if you zoom in in the cortex only, you will see that there are different areas Areas that one can identify um, that, that are also extremely different. 
And then if you take it one step farther and you look in one specific area here again, you'll see that even if you just draw out, uh, as Ramonica Hall did about a century ago in this beautiful drawing, even if you just draw out some of the neurons that you find in, you know, in, a, in a little piece of cortex, you'll find that there are so many different types. And these are not just, they don't just look different, they act different, they are completely different cells. So you, if you move around the entire brain and don't even consider the spinal cord for the moment, you got hundreds of different type of neurons. They're all interconnected with each other in different complex ways and they, they regulate and they perform different functions. And this is another example of how, of, again, of how different they are. If you uh, come out of the cortex and then you look in, 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 in the brain more broadly, you'll see you get the Purkinje cells that look like this, which are very different from the granular cells that you will find in the hippocampus, which are much more simple, um, and, and so on. And th these are like centuries of really looking at the brain and trying to figure out how many types are there really in there. So yes, we talk about a neuron, all of the cells that I just showed you have some features in common. They all, of course, have a cell body. They have processes around the cell bodies called dendrites, which is the place where they receive the information from other neurons. So the information comes in through the dendrites. It's processed in the nucleus. Then they have axons, long processes extending far away and contacting other cells in the nervous system. So the information goes out through the axon to the next cell. The axons are wrapped in myelin so that the impulse is transmitted at a certain speed. If you look down here, where the contacts are made, that are, you know, the, the morphology of, of the contact point is quite similar, neuron to neuron. This is the place where the chemicals are released and so on. Some, some of the general features are the same, but the type of chemicals that are released, the shape of the neuron, and ultimately the function of it um, is very different neuron to neuron. And how is this done? Well, this uh, amazing variety of cell types and all of the connections that put them together are uh, developed over a, a relatively brief period of gestation, if you think about it. It's just the gestation is nine months old, but basically by month three, you have made it all. Uh, so, so nature has found a, a quite uh, efficient way to put it all together. I mean, it took, of course, years and years of evolution, but uh, it happens quite, quite uh, fantastically during early stages of gestation. But why does it matter? And why do we care that there are so many different cell types? Well, we care because uh, um, you will see from this description of these three diseases that, are, that, are, that I'll give you, uh, things go very wrong and go wrong in different ways, depending on what type of brain area is affected in a certain neurodegenerative disease, and depending on uh, how many different types of neurons uh, are affected. So uh, the first disease that I wanted to talk about is uh, ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You've probably heard about this, this horrible disease. Um, is also known in the US especially as Lou Gehrig's disease because this famous baseball player developed it. And this is to me the most difficult slide because I can tell you about what ALS and is and what happens to the neurons, but I will never understand these numbers. <laughs> so I, I just put them there and I just, like I said last time, my husband tried to explain them to me 50 times and I, I don't know. So <laughs> this is very good. It tells me this is not that good. <laughs> and uh, um, so the reason why Lou Gehrig went from being a, an amazing baseball player in 37 to having a very a, a lower rate of uh, batting average uh, in only two years later is because his motor neurons, so the motor neurons that are located in the spinal cord and the corticospinal motor neurons, which are located in the brain, degenerated um, in, in this disease. And these are the cell types that I'm talking about. So ALS is due uh, from a neuronal point of view. There are other cells involved in the brain. But if you just look at the neurons that die, there are only two subtypes that die. The corticospinal neurons, which are located in the brain, these are large excitatory projection neurons. Excitatory means that they activate other cells rather than inhibit them. Um, they are located up here in the brain but uh, they extend this very, very long axon down from the brain all the way down to the spinal cord. Uh, they're quite impressive cells because if you think in a human, they have to extend an axon that can be as long as a meter going from the head down to the bottom part of the spinal cord. 
so very, very uh, complex, fragile cells. And, uh, and then once they get to the spinal cord, this is just a, a, a cross section of, of the cord that I'm showing you here, they synapse or connect to the lower motor neuron or, or just called motor neurons of the spinal cord, which then go out to the muscle. And this second subtype of neurons here also die in ALS. So if you lose this guy and these guys, you basically lose your motor system and you're not able to coordinate muscle function. And uh, uh, this is what uh, happens in, in, I, in ALS. So what happened in Lugeri was that these very large motor neurons of the spinal cord, for example, went from looking like this, nice cell body, dendritic uh, arborization, long axon, and a, a very um, innervated muscle, to becoming atrophic and not being able to control the muscle anymore, which eventually became atrophic. So, um, so it's really a disease of the motor neurons. Because it's a disease of the motor neurons, what are the symptoms of ALS? And it's pretty easy to guess what the symptoms uh, will be here. So there is a weakness of the muscles. Often this starts in the, at the extremities, so in the hands, in the arms, and the legs. Um, and eventually it extends also to the muscles that control swallowing and, uh, and the diaphragm that controls breathing. Uh, there is a lot of twitching and cramping of, of, of these muscles and uh, there are difficulties of course in movement so there is basically impairment of movement, difficulties in talking because of the, of the inability to move the muscles and then eventually as the disease progresses there will be shortness of breath and death due to paralysis of the diaphragm that cannot move um, anymore. So in this disease you lose the motor neuron, you lose motor function. But what does not happen in ALS is that because you lose just the motor neurons, other senses like the sense of sight, touch, hearing, taste, smell, all of the sensory information that comes in from the environment to you, it's received, processed in the cortex and you're very much aware of it. That is not affected because all of these other cells that control this, this, these processes are unaffected in these diseases. In fact, there is minimal dimension in, in, in ALS, although there are cases of frontotemporal dimension associated with ALS compared to other neurodegenerative diseases. This is not the first sign of, of the disease. And then uh, you can get a feeling of how um, you can get a different type of disease, uh, person to person, um, meaning that in some people, like the eyes, um, and the, the, the muscles that control the movement of the eyes or the bladder are sometimes not affected because there are different, even among cells that we, ca we call motor neurons, there are different types and subtypes of motor neurons. So time can be spared and you can have pretty normal motor function uh, in the areas that are controlled by those specific subtypes. Okay, now if we compare, we keep in mind ALS, so loss of upper motor neuron, corticospinal neuron in the cortex, loss of uh, motor neuron in the spinal cord, loss of movement. If we now look at a different disease like Parkinson's disease, in Parkinson you do not lose your motor neurons. What you lose is a specific type of neuron that are located here in a region of the brain called the substantia nigra. So from the substantia nigra, these neurons extend a very long axon all the way down to here to a region called the striatum. When these specific type of neurons start dying, what happens is that instead of having at the beginning motor um, inability to move a muscle, you have actually the opposite. You start moving too much, shaking, tremor, and things like that. And there are also other signs like poor balance. Uh, you may have uh, known someone with Parkinson's disease and there is a particular posture that uh, the person tends to, to acquire over, over time. And there is also a specific way that Parkinsonian patients walk uh, that is very unique to Parkinson and that you do not see in a patient with ALS. Of course, as the di disease develops, you're going to have stiffness of muscles, difficulty of initiating movement and so on, but some of the signs of this disease are very distinct from the signs of ALS. And again, this is due to the fact that a different type of neuron dies here. So if you want to cure disease, it's almost, I mean, it's not, no use to be able to make a motor neuron. You need to make a dopaminergic midbrain uh, substantia nigra neuron. 
And then finally, just one slide about Huntington's disease, which is probably the most terrible disease of all of the ones that I described. Uh, it's, a, it's a late onset disease, which is hereditary. And what happens here is that this entire part of the brain here called the striatum, which is important again for uh, the control of movement, um, degenerates completely to the point that you go from having this part of the brain to not having it anymore. This was not removed, it just degenerated to the point of having a hole in the brain. And when this happened, then you get symptoms that are basically the opposite of what I showed you for ALS. There is jerking and uncontrollable movement instead of lack of movement. And uh, here are two signs that, that you don't find in ALS, and to a certain extent you don't find in Parkinson either, which is a progressive loss of mental abilities. So there is dementia that is associated with Huntington. And then uh, there is development of uh, psychiatric problems eventually in life. And the kind of neurons that die here are called medium spiny neurons. And these are the neurons that go from the striatum, located here, down to the substantia nigra, which is the place where the neurons that die in Parkinson's disease are located. So in this disease, you lose the neuron that go from the striatum down to the nigra. In the Parkinson disease, you lose the one that go from the nigra up to the striatum in terms of connectivity. So two same circuitry, but very distinct neuron types, very distinct diseases, very distinct type of cell that you have to remake if you want to replace these neurons there. And we can go on and on. Um, talking about uh, many other diseases where there is a specific loss of distinct subtype of neurons um, in, in the brain. But again, why does this matter? Well, it matters because we need to, like I said, we need to be able to take an, a neural stem cell that in theory could form many different types of neurons and be able to make it become a specific subtype of neuron the neuron that you have lost in your neurodegenerative disease. So how would uh, um, one do this? So in the rest of my talk, what I wanted to do is to tell you a little bit here about uh, some work that we have done, just, just a few slides as an example, of um, that deals with understanding what neural stem cells are and the discovery of the signals that control the early specification of a stem cell to become, in, in our case, a corticospinal motor neuron. So the ones that are located here and then send down an axon to the spinal cord. And then I'll show you the experiment that Tom Jessel and uh, Johan Eriksson did to uh, induce the differentiation of an embryonic stem cell into a motor neuron of the spinal cord or a dopaminergic neuron of the substantia nigra. And then I'll end by showing you how um, some stem cells are also present within the adult brain. All right. So what we know here is that both in the embryo as well as in the adult brain, there is an endogenous, early in development or even in the adult, like I said, there is an endogenous population of so-called stem cell in the brain that as development progresses, uh, become more and more specialized cell types. So they first become progenitor cells. What the term progenitor means compared to stem cell, you can see it as a more specialized kind of stem cell. It doesn't have the same potential to form all sorts of cell types. It's more restricted in, in, in this ability. And then this progenitor cell make the sort of split decision of either generated neurons or generate glia. And you can distinguish among oligodendroglia, which are the cells that produce the myelin that wrap around the axons and allow the transmission of the uh, impulse through the axon, or astroglia, astrocytes, which have a very important supportive role onto the neurons. And these are really the three broad categories of cell types that you find within the nervous system. And then, as I, we, we talked so far, uh, while here we only show a couple of different types, both this category and this category contains hundreds of different subtypes of, of cells. And all of them, like I said, are generated from 
a pool of neural stem cells, uh, which if you had to extract those from the forebrain or from the brain of a, an E13.5, so early stage of development, mouse embryo, and then reduce them to a single cell substantia and then put them in culture, and then stain them with a bunch of genes that identify the stem cells. They just look like this. They are pretty insignificant cells when you look at them, but they have the ability under the right inductive signals to form many different and elaborated cell types. Now, how are these cells defined? So textbook-wise, to be called stem cells, these cells have to have these three properties. They need to be able to self-renew themselves. So they have to be able to undergo cell division and form more of, of exactly themselves, not of other cell types, but of an, they need to form another stem cell. The second thing that has to happen is that they need to have the ability under the right condition to form all three major types of cells of the brain, so neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. And they have to be able to maintain these two properties over time. So a true stem cell will be able to do this almost indefinitely. That's just the textbook definition of, of what the stem cell is. So how uh, this is, this, these properties are sort of illustrated here, where what I've done is to take um, a mouse embryo. This is, an, uh, this is how an E13 mouse embryo looks like. I have uh, dissociated out the, the, the cortex, uh, the developing cortex, actually, of this embryo, reduced that to a single cell suspension, and put it in a dish. And then if you wait long enough, um, you could the, the, the true stem cells will self-renew, they will divide. And not only they divide, they form this sphere-like structure which are called neurospheres. And in fact, the ability to form these spheres in culture is sometimes um, considered as a sign that you had a stem cell in that dish, because other cell types will not be able to aggregate into a, into a, a neurospheres, more or less. And then if you add to them the right combination of signals, you can form either glia, shown here, or neuron, shown in red here. Very different types uh, of cells. Can you just ask a question? Sure. Uh, one of the things we, we teach the kids is the inability of the nervous system to regenerate. Yeah. Can you shine some light on that? I mean, you're obviously saying the opposite almost. No, so, so the adult nervous system has virtually no ability, I would say zero, to regenerate itself. And you'll see at the end, I'll just show you some slides uh, showing you that uh, while um, uh, some stem cells do exist in the adult brain, um, with the exception of two very distinct regions, which are the subventricular zone and the hippocampus, they will never form a neuron throughout the, li throughout the life of the organism, never. Uh, but you could tweak the system from outside a little bit, and at least as a proof of principle, these studies have been done, they show that in a mouse, you could, with a specific type of injury, make something happen in there such that those stem cells now can remake a new neuron. Uh, it's very inefficient, it's, we cannot control it, and uh, uh, it never happens spontaneously. In fact, I can tell you more. Uh, some, a few years ago, this beautiful study was done, and you might want to go read the paper because it's very, very interesting. So they wanted to know whether in a human being um, any, any neuron of the cortex is added to the cortex after birth, or are all of the neurons that you will die with made during development, right? And so, but they were like, how do we do this in humans? How do we label newborn cells? And so it, it turns out that during the, uh, between, during the, between 1950, 1963, or something like that, in Europe, they allowed uh, above ground bomb testing. And so because of, of this, uh, a lot of C14, so carbon-14, was released into the atmosphere at, at that specific window of time. Then it became forbidden in 1963. But in the meantime, there was a huge, and, and it was not, and they didn't do it before 1950. So they had a peak of C14. So um, anybody who was born and lived in Europe, I mean, 
here too, because it goes with the atmosphere, <laughs> but mainly in Europe, would, would have their cells labeled. Because when you go through cell division and you remake DNA, that carbon-14 would be incorporated. It's like label, you know, m m dating a dinosaur. It's the same kind of, of, of approach. And so what they did then, they constructed a very nice uh, tree in which they measured in the rings of the trees. The study was done in Sweden. So they took these this Swedish pine trees and they measure in every ring. So every e ring, one year, right? In every ring, they measure the amount of C14 that was found in the atmosphere. And so you will find that 1950 was here, 51 here, two, three, 60, 60 was here. And then after 63, it went down like that, right? And so they build their scale. And so they could then take samples from people who died many, many years later and prove that there was not a single cell labeled from that specific period of time. So in, in terms of neurons of the cerebral cortex, other cells in the brain were remade, like astrocyte, oligodendrocytes, but not a single neuron. And this is confirmed by a lot of studies that people have done in the mouse where you can never detect a single neuron be born. Yet you got stem cells scattered through the cortex that could potentially do it. Because if you take that stem cell out of the cortex and you put it in a dish, it will do it. So there are some mechanisms within the brain, built in the brain, and I would say quite strong, that, that inhibits that from happening. And you can you know, speculate about why that is and, and why is it so strictly controlled in regions of the brains that are more complex, like the cerebral cortex, right? You, I don't, probably from an evolutionary point of view, you don't want to add new neurons to a system that is so finely connected and interconnected and it took billions of years to develop, right? So there are reasons why it's so controlled. So I was, to answer your question, yes, the brain does not regenerate on its own. Now, uh, after injury, it has been shown that the uh, cerebral regenerates generates very slowly. So due to injury, that could happen? Yeah, so, but it's not any injury. Like if you have a wound injury, it will not happen. Uh, but I'll show you at the end of the, of the class just one example of a study in which they were able to uh, just kill um, specific subtypes of neurons. And so the injury was very minimal in a way, right? You just kill this neuron and not this neighbor. And when you do it so subtly, then the stem cell somehow respond to some signals, question mark, we don't know what the signals are, that make them differentiate and reform exactly the neuron type that has died. So in principle, it can be done, but we have no idea of how to do it <laughs> in terms of what signal do you use. And that's why I think it's so important that we study them through development during embryogenesis, because that's when those signals are so critically orchestrated to create the nervous system. Yes? Could you tell us what we're looking at in these images? Yes, sorry. Uh, so up here, you just see a clump of cells in culture. So it would be your uh, tissue culture flask. It's a flask filled with media. And the cells have been just, uh, uh, what I've done is to uh, cut out this part of the, of the embryonic cortex, which is just developing at this point, so it has a lot of progenitor cells and stem cells in there. Reduce this, the tissue, means the tissue, and then put this single cell suspension that came from the tissue in this flask. Then you wait about a week in the presence of growth factors and other signals. The cells go from being individual single cells to divide, they divide, 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 until they form these spheres. So this is what you see here. Now, if you, this sphere is cultured in the presence, like I said, of growth factors and factors that promote the division of the cell. If you now take away those factors and you add other factors that promote the differentiation of the cell, you can make this cell here do two things. The first thing that it does, is stops dividing. So this sphere doesn't grow any longer. And the second thing that does is that individual cells come out of here and they form differentiated cells. And what do they form? They form neurons. And so in red here, you see neurons, in a, in, again, in a cultured dish. So they, they come out of the sphere. They, they are placed in a, in a little plate. And they attach 
to the bottom of the plate. And so and the red signal comes from staining with an antibody that recognizes a gene that is only expressed in neurons. So if I did these stainings in, um, so in this plate, in these spaces here that are not stained, I would have this kind of cells. Just I don't see them because I've stained with an antibody to a neuronal specific marker, okay? Now, if you take the same plate and you stain it with markers of glia, meaning either astrocytes or oligodendrocytes, this is what you get. So this one is a, an oligodendrocyte, and the red ones under are um, astrocytes. Sure. Any other question? OK. So I've, I've, I've said a lot of this, so I'll go pretty, pretty fast over this. But basically, the idea is that during early development, you have neural stem cells within the brain that can divide, circle here, and they have all these different options for themselves in terms of differentiation. But once it's believed that once you take, once this neural stem cell decide to start differentiation along this route and become a specific type of neuron at the end here, they will not be able to go back. This is the dogma in the field, but I can tell you also that a lot of research is ongoing where by modifying either the transcription factors within the cell or the environment around them and things like that, um, I'm not so sure there's such a dogma anymore. And uh, it just requires a lot of research to figure out what it takes to have a cell that has already differentiated go back. All right. So in, in our own lab, we have been extremely interested then in figuring out the signal that will take you from a neural stem cell to form a specific type of neuron. And again, we work on the corticospinal neurons. And for the purpose of this class, really, this is really important because our final goal would be to be able to make new neurons and replace them via transplantation in the brain. And uh, here we go back. And every time, sorry, you try to to understand what signals make a specific type of neuron, again, you face this complexity of cell types. And so you wonder how you can study this one type only, this is how they look alike in the cortex, uh, without being contaminated by all of these other cell types that are there and would just uh, contaminate your prep. So what we did, we spent many, many years, so when I was a postdoc in Jeff, lab, um, Jeff Mackley's lab, to develop an approach to purify out of the brain in distinct neuron types. And that was key for us to be able to do that because then we had pure population of types that we can study at the genetic level. And so we took out three subtypes. So the names are really not important now, but there are three uh, type of neurons of the cortex. Um, what I'm showing you here is a sagittal section of the brain. So it's cut this way and look from the side. Um, the cortex is up here. Here is the cell body of the neuron, and the axon extends all the way down, down to the spinal cord. This is a corticospinal neuron. You can take a very highly related neur neuronal type, just position in a different area of the cortex, and then again a long axon down and up to a different region of the brain. And then we also purified out what's called callosal projection neuron, which is a neuron that connects the two sides of the brain. So a, this brain is cut this way, so the two, the two hemispheres. Um, long story short, how did we do that? We took advantage of the fact that all of these different neuron types have a cell body. So the, the cell body of the neuron is located up here in the cortex. Uh, sorry, what I'm showing you here is again a sagittal section, cortex and brain up here. This is the, would be where the, uh, the, the nose would be. Cut again this way, all the way down to the spinal cord, okay? so. This doesn't work. So cortex here, and then you go down to the spinal cord here. So uh, we took advantage of the fact that the cell bodies are located in the cortex, but the axons of these neurons extend very long distance, meters away in the spinal cord. So in a mouse, you know, three centimeters away. And so then we would inject a dye here, and the dye would be transported back through the axon all the way to the, the, the cell bodies of the neurons. And then if you just look at, at the cortex, you will only label the corticospinal neurons by, by definition. 
and this is how the cortex looks like. I mean, this is a very complex slide, but here I'm just showing you, uh, or maybe here is the best one. Um, it's a, a, a coronal section of the brain, and the green labeled cells are only the corticospinal neurons, while all of the other neurons that would be located here or here or around them are not labeled. And uh, so then uh, you use a technique that is called fax sorting that you probably have heard about in the blood. So this is a machine um, that allows you to separate, let's say you have an heterogeneous pool of cells where only some are labeled and you want to take out only the labeled ones. You put them through this machine and the machine reads a couple of things about it, uh, scans one cell at a time and says, okay, this cell is green, has a certain shape, a certain color, at a certain surface uh, characteristics, I'm gonna put it in this tube. This other doesn't have it, I'm gonna put it in this tube. And so what really, uh, it's, it's really nice because what it allows you to do is to go from many, many, many cells of only, where well, only like a couple are labeled, see where the green label is, to basically have every single cell in the plate that is labeled. So now you can start doing some genetics because you have your pure population of cells out. And so uh, what you do next is you ask that now you can ask the question, so what is so special in terms of RNA, meaning what, uh, what, what types of genes are uniquely expressed in a corticospinal neuron versus, let's say, a callosal projection neuron? And the way you do this, you do what Alex was describing before, you extract from this pure population of this, you know, this, you have this, these two different cell types, you extract the RNA, and then you put it on a chip called a microarray. Uh, does everybody knows what a microarray is? Um, so it's this uh, technology that was developed um, about 10 years ago or so, uh, where in the size of a chip, see this is the hand, so it's really inside this window, they have spotted microscopic spots of genes. And so the entire genome can be spotted. So every single gene that is expressed in a cell it's spotted in this tiny little square here. And so then what you do, you take the RNA from your own specific cell, you put it in here, and it will only attach to the genes that are normally present in here. It's really fantastic because in one experiment, you can actually tell what is different inside these cells versus this cell. And so we'll move on, but basically uh, what, uh, uh, let me see, okay. Um, aside from being um, a, a useful kind of research to understand how the nervous system develops, really, these kind of studies, uh, I feel, are kind of important for um, understanding how to regenerate neurons because through this study, for example, we could identify uh, a transcription factor called uh, FASF2, which uh, had never been described before in the brain and we found is required for making a corticospinal neuron. So here, bingo, we have a transcription factor that you can take, put in a neural stem cell potentially, and make it become a corticospinal neuron. And I'll skip through the data except to show you this one, that if you, uh, how did we learn that FASF2 is important for making a corticospinal neuron? We learn it because if you make a mouse that is genetically modified to lack this gene, this mouse also is born without corticospinal neurons. So these nice corticospinal neurons that are located here, in, is this, this bright band of cells here, it's absent from the cortex of the FAS knockout. So this mouse, does not have those neurons at all. So no transcription factor, no neurons of that specific type, but the rest of the brain is perfectly fine. And then we also did the opposite experiment. We took, um, uh, yeah, so we took a neural stem cell in vivo that was normally uh, fated to form a different type of neuron, and we put FAS in here, and we could get corticospinal neurons. So this to tell you that studying em embryonic development is actually quite important. All right, so just to end, um, can neural stem cells be manipulated 
uh, with these signals to make new neurons? Can we do it in vitro? Um, I want to show you just a couple of slides about two studies that did this in vitro. So in a first set of studies, uh, Tom Jessel at Columbia University, they actually opened a new motor neuron center there, building on this. Uh, they, were man they managed to remake the cells in the spinal cord that die in ALS. And how did they do it? They took the embryonic stem cells, they put them in culture, this is how you know, they, they, they look like, and then they exposed them to the same exact signals that these cells see normally during embryogenesis when the motor neurons are made. So they just took development and put it in a dish and, and managed to do it. They also inserted in the cell a fluorescent gene. This is like called the green fluorescent protein. You can, it comes from a, from a, um, a jellyfish. You can genetically put it in a mouse and the mouse will be green. And uh, so <laughs> then you can see how beautiful these green neurons are. So they, they tagged the embryonic stem cells that had been differentiated into motor neurons with green. And then they transplanted them in the spinal cord of a, of a chick embryo. And they proved, and this is a very complex slide, but the message is they proved that they work. So embryonic stem cell, signals that, that you see during <coughs> development, you make a motor neuron, you put it in an animal, and it actually allows the muscles to move. It's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Um, and then uh, a few years later, Joan Erickson group repeated this kind of experiments uh, to regenerate the neurons that die in Parkinson's disease, the substantia nigra neurons. And again here, it did the exact same thing as Jessel did, complex slide, but the, bo the bottom part is the important part. They took the embryonics themselves, they put them through the exact signals that they see during normal development to make dopaminergic neurons, and they remade them. Um, so, so it is uh, possible. And then to answer your question, let me show you where the, let's go here. Uh, what happens if we step out of development, and now development is complete, you have your nice nervous system, you are an adult individual, uh, in this case a mouse, um, do you still have stem cells that are available for regeneration within the brain? The answer is yes. Um, the only limitation here is that while the stem cells are sort of found in different parts of the brain, in the cortex, in the, uh, in the, cortex, in the, in the hippocampus and so on, they are able to form neurons only in two very distinct regions. One is the subventricular zone located here, and one is the dentai gyros located here in the hippocampus. The subventricular zone stem cell produce neurons that migrate a very long distance from the subventricular zone all the way down to the olfactory bulb, the front of the brain, and there they make one specific type of neuron, interneuron of the olfactory bulb, that's it. In the hippocampus, instead, they stay in situ. The stem cells are right here where the orange is, and they form these new, these granular cells that are typical of the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus. These are the only two subtypes of neurons that can be made endogenously by the brain. Nothing else is remade. Um, and this is also to answer your question about injury. Can you tweakle the brain so that maybe um, you can induce neurogenesis, so the birth of new neurons, even in regions where this normally doesn't happen? This has been done in a mouse, but it happens very, only with very, very specific types of injury and in very, very small numbers. So, so in these studies that Jeff did here at Harvard, what they did was to, um, here is the cortex, here is the ventricle, here's the subventricular zone that I just showed you where those stem cells are present in the adult. What they did, they very, very precisely kill only these neurons, the brown ones. And then only when they did that, this, this stem cell mobilized from here, they migrated all the way up here. They f felt some signal that was present here that we don't know what the signal is. I tried to figure out the signal for several years. I gave up. It's very, very hard to find out what it is. Um, and then remake new ones of these brown cells that have died. So it's possible, just go figure out to do it. <laughs> and this has been repeated importantly in other types of injury, um, for example, in the hippocampus uh, after ischemia, or in the, um, in, in the, in the striatum after stroke, and uh, in the corticospinal neurons as well, again from Jeff Matley's group, where he killed 
just the corticospinal neuron and he saw that he could replace some of them from the endogenous stem cells. All right, so uh, it's about time for, oh, sorry, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are many people that try to do that. I. Yeah. So I don't know exactly what he did, but I can tell you of many studies that have really actually affected the field in a very negative way, uh, in which people just took stem cells of some kind or uh, supportive cells and uh, injected them in the brain or in the spinal cord of people with a disease and, uh, and then claimed that they could improve the disease. So um, there is very hard to understand what's going on in these trials because they're not controlled at all. So could be that nothing is going on. And also uh, there is the issue that sometimes even if you inject any cell type in a certain region, these cells can have sort of a supportive role just because they may be secreting for a short period of time some good factors, but then they could also become a tumor or never become a neuron, right? So the long-term consequences of this and really what's going on, it's not understood, and the reality is that none of these people got treated. Right. None of the people that received these transplants uh, got treated because of the transplant or improved or, or anything like that, except for a very short maybe a spike of improvement soon after transplantation. Um, so there are many of us that these days think that we need to go stepwise and try to really understand what we're doing here and remake exactly the type of cell that we need to remake and also take care of the issues of not transplanting a stem cell that then I cannot control once it's in transplanted in the brain and can form a tumor or God only knows what, right? So you have to be careful there. Um, all right, so two summary slides. Um, the message to take home tonight, I think, is really that remember that there are many different types of cells within the brain. And so when we talk about regeneration of the nervous system, we're really talking about regeneration of many different cell types. Uh, there are neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes in the brain. And each one of these categories contain many, many different subtypes. Um, and that different neurodegenerative diseases have different symptoms because you kill different types of neurons. There are neural stem cells both in the embryo and in selected regions of the adult brain. Um, there is hope that we're understanding more and more what are the signals that control the differentiation of these neurons. And I think these two experiments with embryonic stem cells really stand for um, you know, how much hope there is for this kind of work. Um, it might be even possible to just uh, control the endogenous adult stem cells so that you don't have to transplant anything in the brain. You just activate something that is already in the brain. But this is the most important line. How do we do this? We just need to understand more on how to control this whole um, process. And uh, I talked a lot. I have this tendency to talk a lot. Um, and uh, I'll take any question. Thank you. Yeah. Very important question. Absolutely, absolutely. It's exactly what Alex was saying. You have to always think that there are different types. When I say signals, I mean many different types of signals. So there are the signals that are just endogenous in the cell. So there are some things that the cell knows from birth of what the cell will become a long time from now that are just embedded in the genome. It's inside the cell. Then there are signals that the cell sees, you know, because they're secreted from the outside as the receptor to sense it. And then there is also the neighboring cells, what is called the niche. So the cells that surround the cells that you care about that by contact signal to the cell also. So I completely agree that that's really key. Um, yeah.
right, right. Not with the exception of these two regions, the subventricular zone. So there, they're in a very well-defined region of the subventricular zone in a sort of compact area. And they are residual of a region that early on in the embryo had a lot of stem cells there. So they, it got progressively depleted, but not completely. And so some are still there in the adult. And then in the denta gyro is in a specific, it's in a line. It's like in that exact shape that I showed you. Um, it's just packed. Uh, I mean, the stem cells are lining that, that structure, but not in a clump. Now, you wouldn't find them in a, um, like in the cortex, for example. You find them sort of scattered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, not, not specific areas where they really contact. But I completely agree with you that many times when we do experiments in the lab, you get different results depending on whether the cells are dissociated from each other and not able to communicate or when they form a niche and they regulate each other as an organ more uh, than as individual cells. Very important. Yes? ALS is a degenerative disease. What keeps Stephen Hawking alive? What's what? What keeps Stephen Hawking alive? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the progression of the disease um, varies person to person. So uh, the majority of the people would die uh, uh, three to five years after the diagnosis. But you can decide to be connected to, to a, a, a machine that would help you breathe, right? Uh, so I don't know exactly his condition, but there are also people where it's not understood how. Uh, it, it stops or it, it, it begins progressing very, very slowly. So the majority of the people would die after five years if, they, if, you don't connect, if you don't intubate and connect to a machine that allows you to breathe. But there are some people that survive for many, many years. And so this could be a, a, a difference person to person in the susceptibility of the motor neuron to the insult that they receive. What is not understood in ALS is what triggers the death of those motor neurons. Is it something that is genetically encoded in the motor neurons that starts much earlier than when you develop the symptoms, let's say an hyperactivity of the neuron, for example, that over time you know, would accumulate and it would kill it eventually, but you don't see it for many years. So that could be, that's an hypothesis that, that is out there. So it could be that maybe a certain patient versus another, um, this, this activity um, it becomes more chronic at some point. But there are very few people that are in that condition. The majority of the people, unfortunately, uh, die by the fifth year. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.